Our uh, sermon text for this evening will be 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 16, which can be found on page 1264 of, your, of the Pew Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. This is God's holy and inspired word for us this evening. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, who drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But, God, but God's wrath has come upon them at last. So far, reading God's word. Let us go to our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that speaks to us clearly, convicting us of sin when we need, and soothing us in our consciences and our hearts and making us more holy because of Christ. And I ask that you would grant us your spirit here to grant us understanding to this word so that we may grow more and more into the image of our older brother, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I asked my wife when she started teaching recently, what's one of her greatest joys of teaching? And she said that one of her greatest joys is when she sees her students understand what she's teaching. You know, when everything clicks inside their heads. When her students are able to understand the ins and outs of grammar, subjects, objects, prepositions, and the like, and begin to write out complex thoughts in paragraph form, uh, that this all shows that her labor is not in vain, and that her students will be all the, betters, all the better writers in life because of it. And this same dynamic of joy is found in our passage tonight. In the previous passage, Paul talks about his ministry, the labor and love that he poured into the Thessalonians because he wanted to ultimately please God. And tonight, we see the other end of it. Paul is the teacher, and the Thessalonians are the students. We see the word of God, the, the gospel of God that Paul faithfully preached now being received by the Thessalonians. So the previous passage asks the question, what does a faithful ministry look like? And the passage here tonight is asking the question, what does the reception of Paul's preaching, the reception of Paul's ministry look like? And so, from our passage today, we're going to see that the receiving of the gospel is receiving it as the word of God, which works in us so we can be like Christ. Receiving the gospel is receiving it as the word of God, which is at work in us so we can be like Christ. And so, we'll take a look at this in two parts of our text today. First, the actual receiving, the reception of the word, and second, the effect of the word. And so let's look at the first part, the reception of the word. To rewind a little bit, Paul says in verse 3 of this chapter that his appeal, his preaching of the gospel of God to the Thessalonians did not spring from error, impurity, or any attempt to deceive. The entirety of Paul's labors for this church was to be able to preach the gospel clearly and winsomely to the people of Thessalonica. And in verse 13 here tonight, we see Paul's great desire of, of his labor 
coming to fruition. This is the second time in this epistle where we see Paul thank God for the, for the Thessalonians. The first time uh, is at the beginning of this letter in chapter 1, verse 3, where, or, sorry, verse 2, where Paul thanks God unceasingly because of the Thessalonians' outward fruits of their faith, fruits that were richly characterized by the highest of virtues of faith, hope, and love. But here in verse 13, Paul thanks God for something more foundational. He, he thanks God for the fact that the Thessalonians saw the message of the gospel, the message of his preaching, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. The gospel, brothers and sisters, we must remember is not the word of of men. It, it does not fall in the same category as self-help seminars or, or wise gurus, though many unbelievers would like to categorize the gospel in that way. The gospel, the, the message of the person and saving work of the incarnate God, Jesus Christ, is at every single point at odds with the word and wisdom of sinful men. Uh, self-help seminars and mystical religions are, are all rooted in the sinful mind of men. Though they can come in various shapes and forms, the word of men have the same basic message. We aren't really that bad inside. Sin is an outdated concept, and we just need to be awakened to the fact that that we can do actually a lot with the power of our natural selves. The efforts of humanity basically can solve all the world's problems. The message of the gospel, on the, on the other hand, paints an entirely different picture. It paints the picture that we are all enslaved to sin. And though we may be able to do good things in our lives, they cannot solve the, the fundamental problem of the rift between the relationship of God and man. We need a perfect savior and mediator between God and man because we just can't do it on our own. The gospel and the word of men are, are fundamentally opposed to one another. One is water and the other is oil. They just simply cannot go together. Those who view the gospel as simply another message of, from the minds of men either have a, a too low a view of God or a too high a view of man. But the Thessalonians saw the difference between what Paul preached and what the world was saying to them. When Paul came to them in true earnestness with his preaching, the Thessalonians accepted the message of Paul not on the same level as what they heard all around them from the pagan Roman world. They saw what Paul preached as having an authority that is uniquely divine, holding an authority that is reserved to God only. Seeing how the Thessalonians received Paul's preaching, we must ask ourselves, how do we see the gospel of Jesus Christ? and the Bible in general, I would say. Is the message of the gospel just another message on the long list of messages of men? Do you see your Bible as just another book among many, having some nice nuggets of wisdom here and there, but seeing it as nothing more than the collected words of misguided men? Or do we see our Bibles as God actively speaking to us. His word holding supreme authority in our lives because it is actually the creator speaking to his creatures in his word. This is a fundamental question I would argue that everyone in this room must ask themselves. How do you see the Bible? How do you see the gospel of Jesus Christ? The answer to this question ultimately reveals our hearts. 
whether we are against God or for God. When I was in California, I would serve in a youth ministry there, and the, the youth kids would often ask me, how can I hear God? I want to know what he's saying to me in my life. And, and that was a great question to ask, isn't it? They, they wanted to commune with God. They wanted to acknowledge and live out God's authority in their lives. And in, was, in response, I would ask what they, thought of, what, the, what they thought the Bible was. For these youth kids, from my experience there, the concept of God speaking to them and what the Bible was, they, those two things were completely separate in their minds. I would regularly teach and encourage them to understand that if they wanted to hear God speaking to them, all they needed to do was open their Bibles. That, God, that the Bible was God quite literally speaking to them. The Bible is the word of God. Every word of it. And, and it's, in, it's in this book from beginning to end where we find the person of Jesus Christ, the, the king of all creation and the savior of sinners offered to us. The central message of the Bible is not that we need to try harder as human beings. That is totally the word of men and has no place in the word of God. The central message of the Bible is that we are sinners through and through. And we need the one that God has sent, his son, Jesus Christ, to bring new life to dead sinners and restore man's relationship to God. This message was what Paul preached. This is the gospel. And this message is exactly what God says to us today. Through his word and all his word holds his divine fingerprint and authority. But how? How do we come to see the gospel as the word of God? Another way we can ask that question is, why are there some who see the, the preaching of the gospel as merely the word of men? While we Christians see the gospel as God's word to us. The answer to this question can be seen in, in Paul's preaching in Acts 16, in the conversion of a woman, woman named Lydia. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that story. Lydia was a woman who was a seller of purple goods in the city of Philippi. And Paul had gone to Philippi in order to preach the gospel there. And when Lydia heard Paul's preaching of the gospel, Acts chapter 16, verse 14 says, The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. What this verse says is absolutely key to understanding what was going on in the hearts of the Thessalonian Christians and, and what happens in our hearts today. The only reason why we and the Thessalonians came to recognize the gospel message as the word of God is because the Lord himself opened our hearts to see it. The Holy Spirit who, who is the one who comes into our hearts and opens a heart that sin has shut tightly closed. The, the Spirit warms the heart of of a heart that is frozen cold because of sin. And it is only the Spirit who can do this. And for those of you who have come to trust in Christ, it is only because the Spirit actively worked in you. It is only the Spirit of God who opens our hearts to recognize and understand the Word of God. And in Christianity, the Word of God and the Spirit of God always go hand in hand. The two are never divorced. It's the Spirit's prerogative and power 
to take the preaching of God's word and powerfully illuminate it in our minds and hearts so we can see Christ for who he really is. This is why Paul thanks God that the Thessalonians saw his preaching as the word of God. It's because God's the one who did it. God's the one who opened the the minds and hearts and eyes of the Thessalonians to see the gospel as the word of God. God was working in the hearts of the Thessalonians. God was speaking through Paul. And God is thanked and glorified for all his sovereign work in his people. But the word of God not only impacted the faith, the inner life of the Thessalonians, but Paul says at the end of verse 13 that the word of of God that they received was at work in them. The Christian understanding of the word of God is that they are not just words that, that sit on a page idly, but the effective word of God. In verse 13, We saw the Thessalonians' reception of the word of God. And from verse 14 on, we're going to see the effect of the word of God in God's people. Uh, In one of my favorite movies that I've seen this past year, it's called The Professor and the Madman. One character gives this memorable line about the power of books. He says... I can fly out of this place on the backs of books. I've gone to the end of the world on the wings of words. If earthly books are able to take us to the end of the world or even to different worlds in a galaxy far, far away, then God's book, the word of God, takes us to an even greater world, to to heaven itself where Christ is seated at the very throne room of God. God's book, the, the word of God, doesn't tell us of fantastical creatures so that our imaginations can run wild, but focuses on the greatest problem that you and I have, the wrath of God against sinners like you and me. The word of God, as it is preached to us, records the words of our gracious high king, Jesus Christ, who says to all those who believe in him, you are forgiven. But the word of God not only soothes our consciences uh, from our sins, but is actively at work as we live our lives now. What does Hebrews 4.12 say? For the word of God is living and active. The word of God does not sit idly on the page like any worldly book, but it is taken by God the Holy Spirit and works works in us more and more to be like our Savior, so we can be like our Savior, Jesus Christ. If we're going to take everything that I've said in the past five minutes and put it in like a summary form, It is the Spirit of God taking the Word of God to make the people of God into the likeness of the Son of God. But what did the working out of God do amongst the Thessalonians? What was exactly the effect in their lives? And here, it's something that may be unexpected or even uncomfortable for some of us here. Paul does not describe the working out of the word of God in the Thessalonian Christians as leading to happiness, peace, and a good life. No, the the text clearly says to us that the reception of the word and its outworking in our lives led to suffering in this life. Paul describes that the outworking of the word in the, in the Thessalonians' lives was shown through the imitation of the Christians in Judea. This new Christian life of the Thessalonians looked very much alike to that of the Christians near and around 
Jerusalem. And so what did that look like exactly? The Christians around Jerusalem at this time were heavily persecuted by the Jews in Judea. This makes sense given that the center of Jewish authority at this time was in Jerusalem, kind of in the middle, the capital of that area. With the explosive growth of the church, the unbelieving Jewish authorities in Judea doubled down on the persecuting of these people who said that Jesus was Yahweh, the God of Abraham. And that he was the Messiah who would forgive the sins of Israel. The ethnically Jewish Christians in and around Jerusalem, like the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter, were being beaten, spit on, and driven out by their own countrymen, their fellow Jews. In the Jewish Christians' eyes, it was like their family was kicking them out of their own home. In verse 15, Paul lists out how these unbelieving Jews persecuted the Christians around them in Judea. We see first and foremost that the Jews killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets. The the Jews during Jesus' earthly ministry hated Jesus' message of gospel reconciliation and, and elevated the traditions of men the word of men. Because the Jews saw Jesus as a threat, they they had him killed, which ultimately in God's providence would be the way that God would accomplish salvation for his people. But the prophets who spoke God's gospel message after the Lord Jesus were also hated by the Jews and in turn faced the same consequence as their Lord. Or those whom the unbelieving Jews couldn't execute. They had the Christians in the region driven out, kicked out of their own homeland. In doing this, we see at the end of verse 15 that the Jews displeased God and opposed all mankind. It's rather obvious why all these actions by the Jews displeased God. The God that these Jews said they worshipped had sent the long-awaited Savior, but the Jews so hated the Savior's humble message of faith and repentance that they crucified him instead and persecuted his people. In essence, the Jews were spurning the God that they claimed to worship. But in what way did the Jews oppose all mankind? Rather strong language there. This was because they were opposed to the one gospel message that could save all mankind. Christ had come as a man to take on our sin so that we may have his righteousness and holiness, and this would be graciously offered to all without exception to all those who would humbly believe in Christ's name. Those opposed to this gospel were opposed to the ultimate good of mankind. And the unbelieving Jews went above and beyond, really, to oppose all mankind by, what it says in verse 16, hindering Paul and his fellow missionaries from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Not only were the Jews persecuting the Jewish Christians in and around Judea, but they were going around to the Gentile regions of the Roman Empire for the single purpose of hindering the ministry of the apostles' preaching. We see all throughout the book of Acts where the Jews were programmatically inciting riots and stoning and mass chaos in order to distract and hinder Paul's preaching. So this is what the Jewish Christians were up against. And Paul says here that the Thessalonian Christians were up against very similar trials and persecutions. The Thessalonian pagans were seeking to kill and drive out the Christians in that city. Their own countrymen were kicking them out of their own homeland, just like the Jews. 
And when we come to trust in Christ as our Savior, this does not ensure a comfortable life, as I'm sure many of you know. And in this day and age, it becomes clearer and clearer on how opposed this world is to Christ, his gospel, and his people. But as we are conformed more and more to look like Jesus as the word is at work in us, then our lives as a whole will look like that of Jesus as well. His life, as Paul mentions here, is marked by suffering and ultimately death. And those who are united to him, inevitably, our lives will be marked by suffering and death because we are so associated with Jesus and his cross. But all this talk about persecution is it's not here to discourage you, of course. Though these early Christians suffered and lost severely because of their faith, what does Paul thank God for at the beginning of this letter? Chapter 1, verse 3. Your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in, in our Lord Jesus Christ. The effect that the word had in the lives of the Thessalonian Christians was an enduring, steadfast hope despite all the suffering that they endured from the hands of those who opposed the gospel. This is the great effect that Paul was giving thanks to God for. And why is he so concerned with this, the enduring of suffering from those opposed to Christianity? It's because Paul is intimately aware of the reality of the world that we Christians live in. He's not naive, but tells his beloved children that in the Lord, that until Christ returns, the Lord has not called them into an easy world, but a world that is in conflict with what we believe. It is a violent world and a world full of spite that seeks to take every pains to thwart the work of God in his own church. In fact, Paul is only repeating what Jesus said. Our Lord said in John 15, verse 20, Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But the hope that the Thessalonians and we are given by the working out of the word in our lives is not only a hope that goes against those who are opposed to the gospel, but it is a, a hope that looks forward to something. Not just a negative hope, but a positive one. For what does Jesus say in Matthew 5.10? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs belongs the kingdom of heaven. Christian hope not only stands unwaveringly against the constant waves of suffering, but it looks up longingly and hopefully to the great and final prize that awaits us. True Christian hope looks at the sure and glorious end when Christ returns and makes everything new, when, when we will commune with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in full and consummated holiness and righteousness, where the pleasures of this world pale in comparison to the incomparable joy that we will have in Christ with our resurrection bodies. When we know this, that sure and glorious end. The great future salvation wrought for us in Christ. Then we can say with Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. 
let us stand firm in the word of God. Let us see that the word of God for, for what it really is, and it will work in you to endure suffering for Christ's name. As we look resolutely to the joy set before us. But Paul is not only talking about the great and glorious future for Christians, but also the terrifying and damning future for Jews and Gentiles who opposed all mankind by the hindering of the preaching of God's word. He describes these gospel opponents in verse 17 as filling up the measure of their sins. Here Paul is saying that God delays his ultimate judgment until a, a sinner has filled up the amount of sin that God has appointed for that person. A similar description is given to the Amorites, a, a group, an ancient group of people. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, when God says that he will not judge them yet since the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So there's a set mark there that, that God has for people. For all of God's enemies, there is a measure that God has appointed for all their sins, and he will come in judgment when that measure has been filled. And this is Christ's promise to us. That is actually good news for us, knowing that our enemies will, will face judgment by our good and righteous king. It's Christ's promise to us, his kingly rule that will subdue all his enemies. But let's look at the last sentence of verse 17. It's rather strong. But wrath has come upon them at last. The end of verse 17 actually gives a ray of hope, though it sounds rather condemning, and it is, but it gives a ray of hope in two ways. First, Paul says that the wrath has come upon them at last, as if it's already come. The wrath of God has already come to these gospel-opposing Jews and Gentiles. Though final, eternal wrath has yet come for unbelievers, in what way has the wrath of God already come to them? And Paul answers this for us in Romans 1, where he says that the wrath of God is revealed. It is currently revealed against the unrighteousness of man. And it's specifically shown in the hardening of of their hearts. God has given these people up in judgment to the blindness of their sin, and they will only incur greater and greater wrath because of it. The wrath of God having already come to unbelievers in, in some measure is a ray of hope for us as Christians. Again, because as God reveals his wrath against them, we know by the testimony of God's word that he is watching over his people. He is guarding us. He is protecting us and subduing his enemies even now. But this last sentence of verse 17 gives a ray of hope in a different way as well. God's wrath has come now in a provisional way to those who are opposed to gospel, to Jew and Gentile alike. But for all of us in this room who right now trust in Christ, we were all once under God's wrath, were we not? In our hearts, we were no different than the Jews who killed Jesus and the prophets. We displeased God and opposed mankind in our hearts because we were once of this world, in bondage to sin, at enmity with God. We were once filling up the measure of our sins and headed toward an eternity of separation from God. But if Paul, the Apostle Paul, and the Thessalonians who were, who were receiving this letter are indicators of anything, they are indicators of the fact that God saved sinners who were once 
under his wrath. That's the great, that's a, that's a great mystery, but the greatest of news, isn't it? That God, though his wrath was against us and, was, and he was at enmity with us, still loved us in a way, in his son, in a way that we just cannot comprehend. And that he would send his own son to save his enemies so that his enemies would become his sons. Paul, the Pharisee of Pharisees, that Jew of Jews, came to receive the gospel as the very word of God. And here, as God uses Paul, Thessalonian pagans who were once pagans and now Christians have now come to see the gospel as the word of God. This is God at work through his word. Christians, this is the God who who has powerfully worked in you to save you from your bondage to sin. But for those of you who see the message of Jesus Christ as just another message among many, as simply the word of men and not as God speaking to you now, then God's wrath, I will say, has already come upon you. You are blind to the message of gospel reconciliation in Christ. You are filling up the measure of your sins. And, but, but, but God calls you out now. Calls you out now to repent from your sins. Turn away from the evil desires of your heart. And run to Jesus for your life. There is no life apart from him. Look at those around you worshiping this Jesus and see that it, that that they have been changed from the very heart to see the word of God as the word of God. And it is right now powerfully working in them. Believe in this Jesus who created you and offers you salvation even now. Brothers and sisters, this is what the reception of the gospel looks like. Christians look at the Bible and hear the preaching of the gospel as the very word of God. We hear the preaching of Jesus Christ and we hear the voice of our shepherd tending his wayward sheep to the safe pasture. And we humbly accept the word of God and live under its divine authority. And when God does this in our hearts, He also works in us alongside his word so that we become imitators of Christ, suffering like him, sharing in his death so that we may also share with him in his life. But we are not a people discouraged by this worldly hate, but a a people whose whose eyes are, are heavenward who looks upon the great reward that Christ has earned for us and looks forward to the judgment, looks forward to the judgment when all of God's enemies will be finally dealt with. So let us receive this gospel like the Thessalonians did. And our God will work in us and will keep us all the way to the end. Let us go to our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I'm sure all of us who trust in you can attest to all the various multifaceted ways in which your word has come to us. And Lord, thank you that you have so worked in us so that we may hear this message 
as the very word of God. That it is God offering salvation for us. And Lord, we do ask that through this passage here in 1 Thessalonians, and also as you regularly bring to our Bibles, as you regularly bring us and gather us here together every Lord's Day to hear the preaching of your word, that your word, O oh God, would be active and effective in us by the power of your spirit, conforming us more and more to the image of your Son, O oh Lord Jesus Christ. And that surely in our union with him, we would share in his sufferings, but also at the same time share in his life now. All for the glory of your name. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us all stand and...